Tracy Parsons. Um, it is indeed a, a pleasure and an honor to be here today to talk with you about this really important, critical subject matter that's uh, really plaguing all of our communities downstate uh, as well as across the country. And uh, it's very timely. Uh, let me just say it that way. And uh, I was thinking, it's been at least, at least 15 years since I've spoken here, if not longer. So I was, it's so long ago that I couldn't find the date and the time that I was here uh, to speak uh, in this, this uh, forum. So when Ann and I talked a couple of weeks ago about uh, kicking off the series, uh, I was indeed uh, pleased that it worked out on my schedule to come out and, and again talk with a new and maybe a little different audience. Uh, I see a number of familiar faces and uh, thank you for coming out and those that are coming out and hearing me for the first time, uh, thanks for coming, coming out as well. So uh, community violence um, is taking on a life of its own, again, in communities down south of Chicago. So we, we have, as we talk about things in the state, we have to separate ourselves from Chicago because um, that's just a whole nother animal and a whole nother level. And I like to talk about the fact that because we are smaller, we really have the solutions in, in our grasp. It's about the will, it's about the collaboration, it's about the partnership um, to, to address this issue. And so uh, I am a homegrown guy, went to Urbana High School and grew up in Urbana and returned home in the 90s to run a community-based organization. And so that's a rarity here that uh, our local talent stays, comes back, and is an integral part of um, the dynamics of shaping our communities for the future. And I, I, I wanna talk about that because I think that's at the core of finding our solutions, is how do we keep our talent engaged in our future of our communities and having the buy-in and the investment in our, our communities. So I'm gonna go through today and just talk a little bit about community violence in the broad sense. Then I'll kind of talk about um, what we're doing here locally. And then I'll give some, what I think are incentives or opportunities for the, un for the university to take a, a larger role in, uh, in the solutions. Yesterday uh, was the one-year anniversary of the Parkland shooting across the country, or down in Florida. There's been a number of school shootings over the last decade that um, didn't really seem to have the impact that the Parkland incident did. And I, I believe the real key and difference in that Parkland situation is the fact that the students were in the lead of pushing the, the conversation and the agenda. So Parkland's died down too though, right? A year later, we didn't hear much about the one year anniversary of it. We don't really know what's the current state of the student activism that was taking place. And the biggest fear, and for those of you that have had a chance to hear me speak in our community meetings is that we begin to normalize community violence. So far too often, or for far too long, it was seen as their issue over there, as the shooting incidents were primarily taking place in low-income communities, communities of color. Um, but now, it can happen any place, anytime, anywhere, which really requires us all to address and look at this, this issue differently. So, um, there are some root causes at the core of our community violence that uh, we must own as society um, and why we are in this place today. 
So each one of these, I could probably spend the entire hour focusing on them, so I'm not going to get a chance to do it justice to really go through these core areas, but um, I just want to touch on them really quickly. So this notion of uh, disenfranchisement, the historic way that race and class and culture has played and plagued our community, systemic racism is really at the core of the cause of our, our community violence issues. So when we think about drug activity and the impact that it's had on our communities, in low income and primarily communities of color, the drug trade is an economic and social survival issue. And so we th tend to think of drug trade and drug activity, but when you're locked out of mainstream opportunity, you have to survive. And so I just want you to think about that in those terms from an economic and social survival issue. So we've seen the disparities in how drug activity has been treated through the judicial system. Again, I won't go through this to talk about it, but the data is there and clearly uh, identifies and shows the impact of um, lack of opportunity and what it has created in these communities. Obviously, the criminal justice system has been a failure and helped create these communities in these neighborhoods and this infrastructure that's feeding on itself and fighting itself. The failures of the education system play a, a huge role in many of the folks that are committing and involved in gun-related activity. Um, most of them are not real strong educationally um, and, and have very weak and low um, educational levels. All of the isms, racism, sexism, um, culturism, all of those things, Conflict, conflict resolution, so people who, who used to talk things out, kids getting in fist fights, uh, adults handling their conflict, today that's done through gun activity. And so that has uh, made a major impact on how people are resolving their conflict. The will to thrive, high expectations, apathy in the black community. So I don't want to talk about what the systemic and st structural things have done without taking and talking about ownership in the black community. And so we've lost a little bit of that pride, that will to thrive, having high expectations um, and accountability and apathy. Access to resources, opportunity, training, um, lack of, and I could go, lack of will, lack of opportunity, lack of choice, the impact of guns in our society. We're in a lot of meetings talking about where are these guns coming from? How do they get here? How are they getting in the hands of those that um, are committing gun-related activities and gun crimes? So access, rules, law, our ability to address um, how those things are controlled, addressed. Uh, I know I have some of our partners with Moms Demand Action and Gun Sense are in the audience today. And then we really are at a point where we have to talk about intentional work as it relates to recapturing and recovering black men, black boys in our society. And it really is an intentional need and activity that takes place. So uh, in 2009, our community um, had our um, important moment or time and place. We had an officer involved shooting, like you see playing out all across the country on uh, the evening news. 15-year-old uh, shot at the hands of our local police, unarmed. Um, it really did for our community, what, again, what you see playing across the community. So we had the unrest, we had the protests, we had the marches, we had the anger, 
We had people uh, wanting law enforcement, accountability, um, all those things that really have the ability to tear a community apart. Um, we experienced that here as well as most places have. But I like to talk about how and pat ourselves on the back a little bit. Um, I believe how we responded has been unique for Champaign County. So we had our big community meeting. We had over 400 people in the community come out to talk about what they wanted to see, what, what were the issues, what are the challenges, uh, accountability around law enforcement, all of those things uh, we addressed in a three-hour community meeting. And what came out of that was about 50 pages of notes and expectations and demands and requests, discussion about resources, how and where they belong and where they go. So what came out of that is something we call the Champaign County Community Coalition. And uh, I've been speaking quite a bit across the state to realize that um, here in Champaign County, we're in a very unique place. So where can you find a location, a space, where law enforcement, our school systems, our university communities, our community colleges, our parks, our education systems, regular, ordinary community citizens, our faith community, where they all can come together to talk about how we address social and economic challenges in our community. And we call that the Community Coalition. So we've been in existence since about 2012. We've really gained uh, momentum, uh, unfortunately, in 2015 as we began to see our spike in our community gun violence issue. So on one hand, we had the challenge to arise that we all were alarmed and trying to figure out how to address, but it's also been a very uh, important tool for connecting us and giving us a, a common space that we can work from. So you can have differences of opinions about our educational systems. You can have differences of opinions about all of the social and economic issues that, that plague our communities, but the gun violence is something we all can agree is unacceptable. We must stop. We must come together to address it. I always say, and I often say, I should say that um, we can't arrest our way out of this issue. So we really have to look at how we address uh, these issues in this topic and, and do that in a collaborative, cooperative way. So we meet monthly through our community coalition. We meet the second Wednesday of each month at uh, our public library. Right now we have about 100 community members in attendance each month. It's just a fantastic dynamic space where collaboration partnerships are being built all across the community in a really organic way and some very intentional ways. We have a, 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 a organized in a structured uh, strategic way or, or an approach to this work. So we have five priority areas. And so I'll be quick in going through these. Um, so we have police community relations. So communities all across the country are really looking at how do we get law enforcement at the table with formerly incarcerated with decision makers, with community members. How do we address these issues of historical uh, mistrust and lack of trust and confidence in the other, primarily in low, low income and African American neighborhoods and communities? We've got a long history to show that these are very strained uh, relationships with police in these, in these communities. So we've got a very active uh, engagement approach with law enforcement into neighborhoods, into communities, uh, and it's at the core of our work, is how we improve police community relations. Community engagement, so again, you know, when you talk about governmental entities, uh, education systems, how do we engage with the community? How do we get information out? How do we receive information back? For far too long, we sat in our offices and told community members what they should do, how they should act, and how things should be for them. 
how we know that really changes and makes a difference is when those relationships are reciprocal. So we've got to get out and engage our community and communicate um, and empower our communities and neighborhoods where this work has taken place. Through the coalition, we've been very intentional when we talk about black youth uh, as our focus and primary uh, audience that we're working with. So the young man that was shot was a 15-year-old youth that should have been in school, wasn't, um, middle of the day, um, Trump struggling in school. Um, he had lost his mom to cancer uh, two years previously, received no support, traumatized obviously by that, bouncing around different family members, and far too many black youth fall into these categories of uh, not str sound, strong family structures. So how do we support them, engage them, uh, have them be vital parts of our communities. Community violence, as I shared with you, has risen uh, to its own priority area. And I'm gonna share with you in a little bit some of the approaches we've taken on. And then as if you have, a, and then also the fifth area is as we have um, an organization like this where decision makers, are, decision makers are at, everyone says, well, the coalition should be doing this. The coalition should, should be involved in this issue. And so we developed an area that we call mutual advocacy. And that way we can support the work of other organizations, other groups, without having to take on all of the social and economic issues that are part of communities. So police community relations, how do we get law enforcement out into the neighborhoods? How do we get them to meet and know uh, constituents in these areas? So we do everything from engagement activities, um, we've done some cop shop with the cops, we've done some coffee with cops, we try to make law enforcement available and in engaged in all of the community activities that we're doing. We've also gone through some important uh, law enforcement improvements and changes. So a couple of years ago, through the Obama administration, they came out with their 21st century uh, policing report. And so these are a few of the uh, recommendations and suggestions that police departments should have as it relates to uh, accountability, transparency, and those types of things. So we have civilian review boards here locally in Champaign and Urbana. Uh, as cases and situations, uh, we have an independent body that's able to review complaints and review uh, situations. We have every time in all of our law enforcement jurisdic jurisdictions, we have um, use of force. So anytime they get in a fight, pull their weapons, and you know they have a number, and so each time, anytime that those things are used, there's a review of those incidents. Body cameras and cameras in the car, I believe, uh, have made the biggest impact on uh, policing and effective policing and improving the uh, transparency of it. So I remember arguing and debating and, and being in a number of um, really difficult meetings and conversations as we began years ago talking about cameras and the use and how they work with law enforcement. And I believe it's been the best thing to help law enforcement as well as help the community. Uh, we've seen these incidents play out across the country where law enforcement says, this is what happened, and then the camera comes out and shows a different story, and vice versa. So it does help law enforcement also as it relates to um, actions. We have human relations commissions, we have youth academies, we have uh, oversights through our city councils. We're looking at traffic data and stops that are still disproportionately uh, low income, African American, people of color that are stopped uh, two and three more times in our white communities. And so all this data is really important to improving um, community policing. Through the coalition, we've been doing a lot of work around trauma, mental health, and resiliency. And so thinking about the mental health impacts, the impact of trauma that it, ha it has had as it relates to community violence, 
those that are involved directly, family members, neighborhoods. Everyone's really traumatized as we look at this issue um, of, of, of addressing our community violence. We've had over 80 trainings in the last year on everything from the basics around what are trauma to more focused uh, trainings around mental health and resiliency and all of those things as a community through the coalition. So I mentioned black youth. We have to no longer be afraid to talk about these issues in terms of race and kids and who's succeeding, who's challenged. Um, black boys are off the radar screen in all of the negative categories that you look at school discipline, suspensions, lack of academic uh, achievement in higher achieving courses. And we have to be able to say that. We can't talk about what's best for all kids anymore. We can't talk about things in those terms. We have to be specific and targeted and intentional in our work. We put together an initiative that I'm, I'm pretty pleased with last spring. So we were experiencing, uh, we call them cliques. We don't call them gangs. And so they're high school, middle school age kids. So they're friends one week, the next week they're with the other group and they're no longer friends with the guys they were with the week before. So we looked at a group of guys. We, we came up uh, through our two high schools in Champaign and Urbana and we had about 30 of these guys uh, that were just high flyers. We had a big, uh, really tragic fight where there were a huge group of them fighting and a kid was hit and hit his head on the school building. The kids had organized a place to meet to fight and the kid was in a coma for a couple of days. And it really pushed us to say we have to be focused and intentional and in the immediate. So we put together an initiative. We brought these kids in. We told, talked to their families. And it's called Go Getters. Go Getters. And the kids named it themselves, right? So these are kids, again, who were the highest in expulsions, suspensions, all the negative categories. And we've been meeting with this group, this group of guys for over a year now. We had an intentional program last summer where we brought them in, we paid them to come and participate in the classes and everything from conflict resolution, leadership, um, all of those types of things. So we're seeing great improvement in these guys. Their law enforcement uh, interaction has been reduced significantly. The days of suspensions have been reduced significantly. Um, and now we're working on improving grades, right? So we got them in school, we're keeping them in school, now we can start focusing on uh, high expectation and academic achievement. But we had to be very intentional, and so it was controversial because we were paying kids to come to a, a summer program. It was controversial because we were talking about black boys specifically. And, and again, we just have to really be intentional and focused uh, as it relates to this work. So I just wanted to highlight that. We've had a number of community meetings, town hall meetings to talk about our community violence. So I believe every shooting incident is a critical and important issue that we should address, we should talk about. We don't normalize it, we don't say it's okay or it only happened over there or every shooting incident is a crisis, is an important individual issue. All right, so we're doing a lot of data collection. And so we're looking at each one of the shootings. We've been going back, looking at trends. So this up and down scale um, is pretty consistent with what communities across the country are finding. So we start something to address it and we have some success and then we realize, okay, this is no longer successful. So now we have to look at what we need to do differently to adjust, be nimble, be flexible, to keep looking at how we address these, these issues uh, in an ongoing way. In uh, 2018, we had 116 shooting incidents. Again, each one of them are um, critical. So we look at, was there a homicide? We look at the groups that were involved, time of day, location. We're looking at things in the uh, context of 
Are they happening in the open? Are there uh, places that people are hiding that things are taking place? So we're really just scrutinizing the data um, in a collaborative way. So law enforcement has always done these types of things, but now we're doing it as a collective, as a group, uh, community members, law enforcement, um, again, addressing our, our shooting incidents. So I like to talk a lot about the types of uh, shooting incidents that we're having in Champaign County. So domestic incidents uh, are a, a factor in our shooting numbers. Our highest area is interpersonal conflict. So again, a person gets into it with another person, one pulls out a gun and retaliates and shoots, or they solve their interpersonal conflict by shooting at one another and those types of things. The click or targeted area. Now for the first time in October, we came out in our community to talk about gang activity. We've never used that word before until last October to talk about our shooting incidents and those that are involved. And uh, that was intentional. So Peoria, Springfield, uh, and Rockford, those communities, their, their gun violence incident, incidents really are gang-led and driven. Uh, our community and Decatur and uh, Danville are not necessarily gang or clique, but more inter, interpersonal issues and conflicts between individuals. Um, and so just really looking at that dynamic so that we understand what is needed, what services are in place, what do we need to create, uh, understanding who the shooters are and what those situations are. This past year, um, we started to see our shooters become younger and younger. And that was new for us as a community. Um, and so we're starting to study that data. I don't want to uh, come out and say we have youth gangs that are doing uh, a, a huge number of our shootings but it's alarming the fact that more and more young people are carrying guns and solving their conflicts. And I mentioned our go-getters group. That was one of the first things that we talked with them about is how many of them had guns, had access to guns, and almost all of them did. So it's a, for us, that's an unheard of you know, thing that you don't quite understand, but for them, it's a way of life and a, often a survival mode uh, in how they, they operate. So one of the things I wanted to touch on that we've been doing, looking at uh, our work with those that have a long history of being involved with gun violence and those that are um, most likely to be involved in gun violence, either as an offender or a, a, a victim. Um, and we call this initiative Fresh Start. So we have a very focused approach. And I like to talk about that focused approach. I, I really appreciate that as a black male as we talk about policing and effective policing. So I always say that if I'm on the weekend driving through the neighborhoods or driving in the community and I don't have this uniform on, I am just as likely as any other black male to be stopped, searched, harassed, and um, you know, go through that process. When I'm in, sp in, in speaking situations with large African-American populations and groups, and I ask the question, how many of you have been stopped? Stopped for no reason, something real, subjective, you know, almost the whole, everyone in the room raises their hands. And I often talk about the fact that in my uh, time here coming back home, I've been stopped 10 times. Once they told me there was a person in Danville that uh, had my name and was a warrant for the arrest. I said, well, if they live in Danville, why are you stopping me in Champaign, right? So uh, I like the focused approach. And so what Chief Cobb would say to me is that it's a focused approach where you look at you're spear fishing versus casting a wide net. And so what I was t referencing was that wide net approach that for far too long, law enforcement has taken that approach. And so if you're in that area where there's things going on, again, we all are subjective to, uh, to being stopped and believed to be some type of suspect. So with Fresh Start, we, we look at this population, we um, work with them 
those that are interested in change and opportunity um, to really make some better decisions, figure out what their needs are as it relates to employment, housing, uh, getting an ID, coming back from the correctional facilities, what options do they have? We want to help them with that, and hopefully that reduces their activity in the gangs, the, the life, as we like to call it, and, and those types of activities. So we've been doing this initiative. We're going into our third year. It has a three-pronged approach, community, services and supports, and law enforcement. Again, working with this population. Uh, again, it's controversial because, again, the, the general thought is, Let's lock them up. Let's get these bums off the streets. That's the solution. But we have so many individuals that have been caught up in our criminal justice system that are coming back out. We just can't take that approach. So we've got to figure out how to get them employed. We've got to figure out how to get them housed and reduce their need to go back out to street life. So we've had 70 guys that we've approached. About 20% of them have engaged with us, are out of the criminal justice system, they've completed their probation and parole types of things and are productive citizens for us. And the other 80% are deceased, back in jail, uh, still involved in the court system. So uh, it's still a work in progress, but it's, it's part of the solution. It's part of what we're doing and it doesn't solve all of our, our community violence issues. So we've learned some lessons, and I've touched on them as we've been going, but really mental health, job training, skills development, mentoring, peer-to-peer. -peer. We've got to figure out as communities how do we work with the formerly incarcerated population. We can't no longer cast them aside. We've got to make them viable members of our communities through jobs and act. Uh, work and support and engagement and all of those things. And again, starting to just look at youth. So what can we do to catch young people earlier before they get too far involved in the life? So I couldn't wait, I couldn't uh, resist, you know, being on campus to talk about what role the university can and should play and that we need to play um, as it relates to our community and helping to eliminate and, and reduce our, our shooting and gun violence issues. So the first one is really just student engagement. There are no, through our histories, um, areas of activism and protest and unrest that students haven't pay, played a critical role in mobilizing and organizing and holding systems account accountable. Uh, the student population has always been in the forefront of that. So that's why when I referenced the Parkland student uh, population, we saw what difference it made with laws being passed. We saw the national exposure that other school shootings or mass shootings didn't get. It's because of the student engagement and involvement. And so while young people are here in our community, how do we get them involved and engaged in their civic and social responsibility issues as students here at the University of Illinois? Faculty and staff obviously have a very, very important role. It's always interesting to me when I read about a professor or a staff person that's on national TV and talking about the work they're doing as it relates to gun violence or community engagement things, and I've not met them. I've not seen them in any of our local meetings uh, helping us solve this issue. So we have uh, resources and information and all of those types of things right here at our fingertips that can really we need to play a more more vital role and you know I've got a long history of uh, working with different departments here on campus and so I like to talk about the fact that we've been guinea pig for far too long and so what I mean by that is you come into the community you do your research with the organizations with kids uh, we work on the social issues and then you go out and get published and take the work out of the community. So there's not enough leave behind uh, for the, from the work of the faculty and staff as it relates to solving our community's problems and issues. And so we must continue to keep addressing that. Uh, investment in our communities where the universities are housed and um, so creating access. 
I started off talking about the fact that I was a local kid because it's, it's not normal that one, we come back home, but two, that we see the University of Illinois as a tool, as a resource for us. So if we're on campus as kids, we're ran off instead of encouraged to uh, be around and be visible on the campus and be in organized uh, activities and camps and things of that nature to learn that this is the, one of the premier universities in the world. People are coming from all over the world to come to this university and you have a better chance of coming from China or Florida or somewhere else than Champaign-Urbana in this university. I have a number of, all three of my kids, all of my friends' kids that are here locally, none of them have gone to the University of Illinois. They weren't even recruited. They weren't even encouraged to, you know, be students here and learn about this. And so we have to change that for this institution here in our community. So we've had a couple of initiatives over the last couple of years to address this issue and get community kids on campus and um, see this as a resource and a tool to help with goals and aspirations. It's so depressing to talk to a person in, in high school or in middle school that has lost hope. And so that's the reason these kids don't have concern about shooting and fighting and getting in trouble and those types of things because they don't see success for themselves. They've not learned that. They've not seen it in their families and they've got a community that has rejected them and rejected that idea in them. So it's exciting I hear about free tuition for families under $61,000, right? So what's gonna be our local plan to make sure that kids that are in part of this criteria will have access to this university? So I don't wanna say that the university isn't involved. Uh, we have a number of uh, wonderful uh, partnerships and collaborations and individuals are involved. Uh, Mr. Morris Mosley is a counselor here on campus. He was recently at one of our community coalition meetings talking to us about implicit bias and its impact on our ability to do the work. Uh, my friends at WIL have been tremendous at working with us. That's just a photograph of one of their community-based meetings they held where we were talking about educational issues. And so the university is doing and has a part to play. It's just a matter of how do we build on it and how do we, we strengthen it. So I've shared with you just a little bit about our community coalition, how we're trying to address our community's most difficult social and economic issues in a collaborative way. Um, again, we meet monthly. We have a number of subcommittees that have organized real organically. Uh, weekly, I get a call from someone that says, I have an idea, I'm trying to figure out how to get it in place. I said, oh, have you talked to such and such? And, you know, as we, before we know it, we have a viable program and, and activity that's taken place to work on behalf of our uh, community and our young people and primarily our kids of color that are just struggling in all of the areas. So I, was, I wanted to just put the series up again. I think uh, the why, this is a fantastic space. Thank you all of you for coming out. Each week, there seems to just really be dynamic individuals talking about community violence and uh, from a different approach. And so I would encourage you to pass the word and let, let our communities know that this is taking place. So uh, I'll stop there. We only got to have a few minutes left. I'd love a few questions if there are any. Yeah, thank you. So the question is that um, these are Champagne, are Chicago, St. Louis, or Indianapolis problems that have come to our community, and the answer to that is that's absolutely not correct. Most of these uh, kids and families and folks that are involved in these incidents are here. And that's the reason I talk so much about connecting and resources and creating hope and aspiration so that they view our community 
as we view our community as a great place to live and work and, and thrive. So um, I think there are other communities, I think Danville and I think Decatur has a more uh, stronger influence of the uh, shutting down of many of the public housing complexes in Chicago. Um, it's not a major factor here. These are local homegrown folks that are causing the problems. Yes, ma'am. Well, um, I talked a little bit about, we were doing some work here a couple of years ago through a project that we called Access Initiative that was really looking at mental health and the needs of African American kids and their families. Most African American kids are not uh, diagnosed uh, in their mental health issues, their attention issues, those types of things are not addressed uh, at a much later age than white students. And so what happens with black kids is there, you start addressing their behaviors uh, versus what their needs are. So I, I mentioned trauma and the work we've been doing around trauma. So trauma-informed wor work says what has happened to you versus what is wrong with you. And that's a big distinction, right? So uh, I'm not surprised. I don't have any actual data about medication inside the prison system. We don't have a prison system in place that reforms people. It's a holding tank and it's fight for survival and most don't leave out um, in a better place than when they went there, unfortunately. Um, I was watching CNN late last night and I saw a, a young man who had gotten his high school diploma, he'd gotten a couple of college degrees while he was in prison. He came out and he had no more luck finding employment and job so he's written a book about what that process is like and so for far too many African Americans I'll focus there they've had to do superhuman be, be superhuman people to have success in life once they've made those mistakes and gone down those wrong courses we don't have a friendly society to formally incarcerated people Yeah, we're starting to do a lot of work with preteen or uh, with teenage mothers and young mothers uh, through Carl Hospital and through other organizations to ad address teen mothers and, and those things. Behind you, Paul, I'm sorry, she was first. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we have a complex community, right? Because we are a university community, higher educational on some ends and really much lower in other parts of our community. So there are a number of job training programs and services in place. It really is a coordination, it's an access, it's getting people um, connected to the services and supports that are there. And we have to do a better job with our employer population. So I couldn't tell you right now the top five companies that will hire folks with uh, criminal backgrounds. Um, there are some, there probably are not enough. And so uh, we are just starting to really scratch the surface of where the need is and where the opportunity is and how do you better, better connect those. Yes, sir.
Well, uh, let me say this to you, Paul. I, we have a training institute that's located right here on campus for law enforcement that I know our local, local law enforcement folks participate in. I actually personally think we have uh, tremendous leadership with our local law enforcement organizations um, that are really looking at proactive, cutting edge uh, policing, community-based policing. Um, we are just starting to scratch the surface though in the last you know, five to seven years here locally on what we can be and do. Um, but I think we have, uh, again, I travel around the state quite a bit talking about this, this coalition idea and working on the Fresh Start work. And um, I believe our law enforcement is, is stronger than any of the other communities, Bloomington, Peoria, Decatur, Danville, Springfield. They're at the table with us. They're addressing it, and that, and that doesn't mean that it's all being done well, <laughs> and we don't have issues, and we don't have problems, and we don't have uh, cowboy law enforcement officers. It's how do you get those folks weeded out? How do you get effective policing? And I, I believe we're addressing it, you know, so, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I think it's really um, what I'm sharing with our local schools, it's really an individualized approach. And so we know in second, third, and fourth grade, the kids that are charted and, and heading in the course, uh, the wrong course, uh, most of it is because they're so far academically. Um, I don't know if you've seen and heard some of those studies that talk about uh, low-income kids coming to kindergarten, being prepared in their vocabulary. And so they have a vocabulary of two to 300 words where kids that come from homes where they've been read to and all of those things, they have vocabularies of 12 and 1300 words. And so that disparity, kids start off behind and most often don't get caught up if we don't address it from an individualized place. And so um, I'm spending a lot of time with the schools talking about this issue. Again, we can't be afraid to talk about black kids and their lack of success in our schools and have some intentional programming and services. We can't be afraid of that uh, perception or we have to, to, to change the narrative of how we're investing in these kids and their families or we just will continue to uh, see the problems and challenges continue to grow. Yeah, thanks. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so the question was really around how do we have everyone fully invested in addressing these issues? And so the sad part, but good part also is that the degrees of separation are much smaller. 
So I've seen over the last recent shootings, uh, again, because they're happening in different locations, uh, people that have been, uh, we had a young man who was shot and killed in the fall who had played sports with a number of, uh, he, was, he was friends of kids who are influential in the community and that's, you know, when it becomes personal and becomes this was my kid's friend. He's no longer the black boy that was shot in the neighborhood. He's now David, and he's a person, and he's humanized, and he becomes a real person. So uh, we're pushing the envelope. You hear me being very intentional in a lot of my wording today in a primarily white audience. I've started off talking about the history of racism and its impact on where we are today, and I, 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 I'm consistent in my message across. So. I believe, you know, thank you all for coming out. We all are in this together, and uh, we don't solve this unless we all are, are invested and, and humanize the people that are involved, victims and offenders.